So I want to real quick, I want to go to, you're right, the law was a foreshadowing. It, it was a shadow, honestly, of things that were being carried out in heaven. So it's a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. So I want to look at Hebrews 8 real quick. Everybody see that? Can you see that, man? Dwayne? You well, got, do you have that on the screen? I've, I've okay. Got, yeah, I've got it pulled up on. Yeah, we can, it's on okay. the screen now. Sorry. All right. I, I will read this one. Time. Give you a break. Okay, um, go ahead. It says, now the main point in what has been said is this. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens, a minister in the sanctuary, in the true tabernacle, which the Lord set up, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, so it is necessary that this high priest also have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are those who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things, just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to erect the tabernacle. For, see, he says, that you make all things by the pattern which was shown to you on the mountain. So basically what we have here is there is a temple in heaven. Jesus is serving in the position of high priest, and the temple that Moses built, he was told, build it just like the one that's in heaven. Mm -hmm. Now, on with verse 6, it says, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry. Yeah, that's what I wanted to read there is, but now... Uh, Right, yeah, we're we're going to keep going. I promise. Ministry, and yeah. much, he is the mediator of a better covenant, which is right. established on better promises. Yes, yeah, I, we're going to keep going with that. But and then we're talking but, about the new covenant down below there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the phrase "but now" does not do away with anything that we just read, though. It's saying, oh. "But now that Christ is high priest, he has obtained a more excellent ministry." More excellent than what? It was talking about the way that things were done on the earth as a copy in heaven. So now Christ's ministry is more excellent because it's what I said. He's not having to offer sacrifices for sin for himself. He's perfect. He's sinless. So now he's obtained a more excellent ministry to the extent that he is also the mediator of a better covenant. Yes and amen. He is the first fruits of that covenant. Mm -hmm. which has been enacted on better promises. A promise is something that will be fulfilled. Well, you talked about the but doesn't change anything. I disagree with that. That would be like me telling somebody, I love you, but that just changed, negated everything I said before that. He, I, I look at this. As, so do you not still love that person? Still, well, yes. Then it didn't but, change the fact you love them. You're just adding no, to, you're clarifying which is exactly what this passage is doing. But you, you've you got to listen to it, and you've mm -hmm. got to read it just for what it says without trying to make it fit into something that's not here yet. Let me keep going. Okay. Go ahead. Keep going. It says, for in the first covenant, for if that first covenant had been free of fault, no, no circumstances would have been sought for a second. But in finding fault with the people, he found fault with the people who were offering the sacrifices because they were still sinful people. They weren't perfect, but Christ is. Behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will bring about, they are coming when I will bring about a new covenant. But we know that Christ is already in heaven as the high priest in this passage. So days are coming when he's going to bring about a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and I did not care about them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. For they will not teach each one his fellow citizen and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. From the least to the greatest of them, for I will be merciful toward their wrongdoings and their sins I will no longer remember. That's going back to the Jeremiah passage we just read. 
But before he goes there, he says that this is something he's going to bring into existence, even though he's already died and resurrected. This is the covenant he's bringing about. And if we keep going, it says when he said a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. But whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is about to disappear. So it hasn't disappeared yet. It's not going to be fulfilled until the resurrection when he does those things that he promised by writing it on our hearts. We see here in chapter 8 that Christ is fulfilling the role of a high priest in the tabernacle in heaven. Just as he will be high priest on the tabernacle when the kingdom comes to earth. Now, you agreed that when the kingdom comes, the law is going to be reinstituted. There's sacrifices that's going to be reinstituted. Scripture tells us that every person will come to the kingdom to be taught God's Torah, God's instructions, his law. Mm -hmm. Priest is going to be reiterated. Why? Why are they going to be reiterated to make atonement offerings for those sinful people who are still learning the law? But Christ is our high priest because his sacrifice of his life put him in that position where he can make atonement for us. But there's still a prescribed pattern and instructions for how that's done. So we're saying, though, that then his blood's not enough. They're going to make sacrifices to animals of blood of bulls and goats that God never really required of him that that didn't take away. Well, he did require it. it, Well, he's going to use the blood of the animals and stuff. to. It it didn't take away the sin because it was offered by an imperfect person. The sin will be removed at the resurrection. Even the offerings in the temple during the millennial reign is not going to remove sin. It atones for sin. And I want to say one thing about Jesus' blood not being enough. The the reference to Jesus' blood is absolutely, but without the shedding of blood, he could not have died to resurrect into heaven. But tell me one time in Scripture to where God accepted a human blood sacrifice for anything. He always said it was detestable to him. Mm -hmm. God doesn't change. He's not. Jesus is referred to as a sacrifice because he willingly sacrificed his life. He laid that down because he knew the father would resurrect him. But his body, it was not a literal sacrifice for sin or else God just completely went against everything he's ever taught previously. Jesus didn't take his blood and physically sprinkle it on the people or on the altars to to make that atonement. That is a reference or a metaphor for his death because life is in the blood. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean Jesus is not our Savior. It doesn't mean he's not the Son of God, and it doesn't mean that his promise to redeem us and resurrect us at the resurrection is any less true. It just means we've got to take the Scripture in all of context from the beginning to the end. And and if we think that his death somehow made God happy as a sacrifice, and it wasn't a vehicle to get him to be a perfect high priest so he could continue to atone for us, we are neglecting and doing away with half of the scripture. Randy, he was he didn't have to come and die to be the perfect son of God that he already was. He wouldn't have had to die. He could, he could have still performed. He was without sin. He was he was perfect already. But he wasn't human. He was divine until he took on flesh. And a high priest has to be a human to mediate between man and God. He had to take on the flesh. He had to sacrifice his life so he could be resurrected to be that perfect high priest. Well, it's just, I can't, I mean, it's almost like we're nullifying the blood of Christ, though. How? It's how how it feels. How so? Well, because we're still going to accept the blood of bulls and goats later. 
into the future here. I didn't. I didn't to, write that scripture. I know that, but why would they do that when Christ already did? They're putting their faith and going through the rituals when our faith. We're saved by grace through faith and the finished work of the cross that he did. And it's through him and him alone that we are saved, not through the old things that they did back then. I mean, you're, I, you're I, right. I, I Even those things don't my, save us. I mean, yeah. Honestly, I have a trouble wrapping myself around all of that. And here, here's another reason. Um, I mean, I see what you're let me make it clear for your audience, too. It's not that you're not making complete sense in some of this either. I, I kind of see what you're. I see what you're saying to a point. Um, well, you, just, you're having a natural I'm knee-jerk not, reaction. It's, it's called I'm, cognitive dissonance. I was gonna say, and I'm it's not. Normal. I'm not trying to reject everything you're saying. And if it's coming across that way, please forgive me because that's not what I'm trying to do. But I'm trying at the same time, and I knew it was going to kind of be like this, and you did too. Oh, kinda, for sure. Kind of set me up. Um, trying to wrap my head around things because, you know, a good question. I mean, and I feel like it's a valid question. Uh, some may agree, some may disagree, but we've got men of faith that we have known through the years just by their life and the ministries that God called them to. One recently just went home to be, uh, to, to go on to, to eternal, uh, his eternal home is Floyd Lahan. He, his ministry, I was reading about his ministry of the miraculous, of, of actual, God used him in such divine ways, uh, a gift of healing, uh, deliverances, things that happened through a course of years. Um, I mean, and, and I, I asked myself, God, how could you let somebody that dedicated, uh, Luke Parsons that spent more than one 30 day fast. One of my mentors is a child. Which, I'll never forget him. which is the law. So yeah, it is. He, it, we, the fast pray. A lot of things don't come mm -hmm. by lots of prayer and fasting. Yeah. But God, you've let all these ministers preach and teach. And many, if not all would tell you the thing that since Christ came, we've been under the new covenant covenant of grace, mercy, the blood of Christ that, you know, his work on the cross takes away the sins of the world. He bore them upon himself. If that's the case, they've been preaching in error all these years. And to be so close to God, God just didn't want to reveal any of that to them. Only to a few in the latter days. Or if I say few, there's many. Well, is sure, is but, that not scriptural, though? That that the truth will be revealed. His spirit will outpour the spirit of truth to a few in the letter. It doesn't say broad is the gate and broad is the way. And everybody's going to find that that leads to eternal life. Yep. It does say narrow That's right. and few will be that find it. I'm not saying that those men of old weren't, you know, quote unquote saved and that they weren't living right. But I, respectfully, I don't care what they taught or what they preached if we're looking at the scripture and we're only letting scripture be our guide, they were great people, no doubt, that probably had some stuff wrong. But it doesn't mean that their heart wasn't right. It doesn't mean their heart posture wasn't loving God and loving his son and trying to lead people to them. Mm -hmm. Most professing believers keep more of the law than they realize. And, and if we can ever get past this knee jerk, we're going to find that out. I understand that what I'm what I'm saying is is kind of it's a kick in the gut because you know well why would we go back to to the law and why would we go back to sacrifices? That's like saying Jesus wasn't enough. But your argument's not with me, there, brother. Mm -hmm. I did not write that, but the scriptures do tell us that's what's going to happen. So then we have to ask ourselves if it says it's happening in the scripture. If scripture says that that's what's going to take place, there's got to be something between our understanding of what we've read previously and what we think we know mm -hmm. versus what scripture's actually telling us because this don't make sense. They were they they kept the law, Christ came, became the perfect sacrifice, they don't keep the law, and then now when the kingdom comes back, they're going to be keeping the law again. You're right, that doesn't make sense. No, it's kind of confusing. 
Well, and, we and God's not the author, author of confusion, no, but God not. is the author of Scripture. Yeah. So if he says they kept it here, and then we have interpreted this New Testament to mean we don't keep it, even though they keep it all throughout the New Testament. They're instructed to keep it. They're told to keep it. And then we read in the eschatology, the, the second coming of the kingdom, that we're going to be keeping it again. The, the confusion's not with Scripture. It's not with the author of Scripture. It's with us and our interpretations based on what it is we think we know.